I've been traveling a lot lately. I've been uh, five different places for the five past Sabbaths. And I guess it's kind of the phase in my life where, as a single young man, I can travel around and go do things like that, see different people, different places. But then there's also other times where I wonder, what's God's purpose for me as a single young man? And there are times when I wonder, when's God going to put me in a marriage? And sometimes it's not clear what God's purpose is for me right now. And I think that's kind of something we all face from time to time within our lives. Maybe we're unemployed for a time, and we wonder, why am I struggling to find a job? Why isn't it coming? Or maybe we're in a job, and maybe it's a hard job, and you wonder, what's the purpose of me being in this difficult position, and why is God not giving me a better job? Or maybe it's a boring job. Or maybe our job is simply cleaning the house, doing the laundry, making breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we find ourselves in these routines every day of our life, and we wonder, what's the purpose of it? And sometimes it's not so clear, and sometimes it's easy to just kind of give up on this point, purpose, the, whatever situation or position in life we find ourselves in. I brought up here with me a book called Man's Search for Meaning, by Viktor Frankl, and in it he talks about his experiences in the concentration camps of Germany during World War II. And each day that these prisoners in these, intern in these concentration camps, they had to answer, ask themselves the question, why am I continuing on in these tough circumstances? And he talked about how there were many people who failed to find a meaning and a purpose for continuing their life. In one account, he describes this as a condition called give up itis, which the American soldiers kind of nicknamed. He said that he would often see someone who at five in the morning um, refused to get up and go to work, instead stayed in the hut on the straw wet with urine and feces, nothing Neither warnings nor threats could induce them to change their minds, and something typical occurred. They took out a cigarette from deep within their pocket, where they had hidden it, and started smoking. At that moment, we knew that for the next 48 hours, we would watch them dying. Is this not reminiscent of another parallel that confronts us day by day? He continues on. I think of those youngsters who on a worldwide scale refer to themselves as the no future generation. To be sure, it is not just a cigarette to which they resort, it is drugs. In fact, the drug scene is one aspect of a more general mass phenomenon, namely the feeling of meaninglessness. Last uh, December, I read a Washington Post article saying that the life expectancy in the United States has decreased for a second year in a row and that it was largely due to a 21% increase of deaths due to drug overdoses. And I've not seen any hippie movement starting recently, so I can only wonder, is it because of a feeling of meaninglessness that seems to be growing and growing? Even us, as Christians, we understand we have an overall purpose and an end goal, but sometimes in our lives we find ourselves in a situation where we wonder, what is the meaning of this point in my life, and sometimes it's not very clear. And so, the question is, how do we find meaning in these small, trivial things in life? Yes, even the great Solomon wrote, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What labor does man have in all of the labor which he does toiling under the sun? And so it's difficult to find a meaning within our life. So. I'd like to recount a story that we are all familiar with in Genesis to begin to answer this question of how we find meaning. In Genesis chapter 37, I encourage all of you later on to go read the full story. But in Genesis 37, the story begins about a young man named Joseph who had a good life with his father and his family there. He was the apple of his father's eye, and his father was very wealthy and took care of him very well. 
But one day when his father told him to go check on his brothers, they threw him in a pit, and they would have killed him right then and there if Reuben hadn't intervened. And instead, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, into a foreign land where they spoke a foreign language, and he, as a Hebrew, was disdained that any self-respecting Egyptian wouldn't eat at the same table as a Hebrew. So he went from being the apple of his father's eye to being the lowest of the low, a slave. And it's at this point, Joseph could have chosen to give up. He could have chosen to feel pity for himself, but instead he chose, made a different choice. The same author that wrote Vanity of Vanities, All is Vanity, also wrote in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work, nor wisdom, or knowledge to the grave, in the grave where you are going. And so there, we have this sense of, well, this is a meaningless life in, a, in some regards, but the best thing you can do is keep trying and keep going until you find a meaning. Viktor Frankl offers an analogy toward the ends of, end of his book. Consider a movie. It consists of thousands upon thousands of individual pictures, and each of them makes sense and carries a meaning. Yet the meaning of the whole film can't be seen before its last sequence is shown. However, we can't understand the whole film without having first understood each of its components, each of the individual pictures. Isn't it the same with life? And so sometimes it's not clear. We see little scenes of an overall story within our life. Joseph was sold as a slave in Egypt, and he didn't quite understand why he was a slave in Egypt, but he, did, he worked with his might, and soon he was the overseer of his master's household. But when things were starting to look up, he was suddenly cast into prison for something he didn't even do, and he found himself at the bottom. And again, he could have chosen to give up, but instead he chose to, do it, to live life with his might, and whatever his hand found to do, he did it. And he befriended the jailer, and soon he was overseeing the jail. And so in the end, Joseph became the second in command over all of Egypt. And at the end of the story, when his brothers came back to him, he told them, I know you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He could see that all of these different pieces that seemingly had no purpose came together in a way that he could not have even imagined. So when we are faced with difficult and trying times, we have a choice to give up or we have a choice to believe that in the future, everything will come together in the end. And that is what uh, Viktor Frankl did when he was in the concentration camps. That helped him get it through. He, in one account, he wrote, I kept thinking of the endless little problems of our miserable life. What would there be to eat tonight? If a piece of sausage became as an extra ration, should I exchange it for a piece of bread? Should I trade my last cigarette, which was left from a bonus I received a fortnight ago, for a bowl of soup? How could I get a piece of wire to replace the fragment which served as one of my shoelaces? Would I get to our work site in time to join my usual working party, or would I have to join another, which might have a brutal foreman? What could I do to get on terms with the capo? I became disgusted with the state of affairs, which compelled me daily and hourly to think of only such trivial things, I forced my thoughts to return to another subject. Suddenly, I saw myself standing on the platform of a well-lit and a, a warm and pleasant lecture room. In front of me sat an attentive audience on comfortable upholstered seats. I was giving a lecture on the psychology of the concentration camp. All that oppressed me at that moment became objective, seen, and described from the remote viewpoint of science. And so even in such difficult circumstances, Frankel looked beyond his present situation, and he saw how this situation could have meaning in the end, 
that he could draw from his experiences and teach others. And so it was this hope that kept him going, even when things were difficult. If you'd all turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon here writes, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. And he goes on and lists different times and purposes. And so our life is not just one single purpose, but each moment in our lives, there is a different time for each purpose. And we see that in the story of Joseph, how there was a time when he was a slave and he was low. And then there was a time when he was overseer of his master's household. And then there was a time when his brothers first came to him to refrain from embracing. And then there was a time to embrace. There was a time to pluck uh, what was planted, seven years of plenty and a time for destruction, for breaking down and for building up. And God has these different times and these different purposes in our life. And we have to just wait and trust that they will all work together in the end. Later on in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, in verse 11, Solomon writes, Also he, God, has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God has from beginning to end. It's just like Frankel wrote about the movie. You can know each scene individually and find the meaning of each scene individually, but until the end, until you see the closing scene, you won't fully understand the picture and the story that God is creating in each and every one of our lives. And so even when life seems difficult and when life seems tough, we can choose to find meaning in even the smallest little things and we can trust in God that he has an overall purpose for everything that he's doing within our lives. And we can remember the very comforting words he gives us in Romans 8 and, verse chap uh, Romans 8 and 28. All things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose.